what we are going to take a look at today uh, and over the next couple of classes because, uh, you know, a lot of it depends on how far we get today. Um, and I only have a vague plan in my mind, so I'm going to let the lecture dictate to me in what sequence I cover these topics. I don't know, that, that, that sounds like I'm a weirdo or something, but, but you know what I mean. I'm, I'm going to try to let it flow naturally, and as long as we cover these things over the next few classes, to a degree it doesn't matter what order we cover them in. We're going to review session variables, because we talked about them last time, we're going to see how you could use them, and uh, things of that nature. So we're going to review what we did last time. We're also going to review programmatically creating um, database access and, and, and data sources, SQL data sources. We've seen how we can drag them over using the GUI, but even if you do that, you know, it's good to know what's going on behind the scenes and all, and all that so that you can, you can correct it if something goes wrong and you're not totally thrown for a loop. So we're going to look at that as well. We're going to get into inserting, updating, and deleting stuff from the database using um, a couple of ways. One, using the stuff that is built into the um, grid view and details view, and also um, doing things um, on our own and programmatically writing the statements that will do an update and, and creating that. You, you always have that option with, with any sort of, I, uh, not IDE, uh, any sort of framework. There's like a framework that's set up to do something that you want to do frequently. And for some tasks, it works perfectly. All right, the framework is exactly what the doctor ordered. You can do everything that you need to do. But then there's always some tasks that don't really fit the mold for the, that the framework was meant for, all right? Well, you have a decision to make then, all right? And either of these decisions could be valid, all right? One decision is to figure out how to make what you're trying to do work within the framework, all right? Maybe by tweaking the framework a little bit or by writing a little bit of custom code or whatever. You can get the framework to do what you want it to do. So that's one approach. The other approach is like, I'm just going to do it myself and write the code yourself. And it's good to have both of those uh, tools in, in your tool belt, the ability to understand how to do things the way the framework does them, and also to understand how to sort of go off-road and say, hey, I'm just going to write it myself. All right? And there you go. All right? So... We're going to look at doing adds, updates, and deletes both ways. Just like we looked at doing select statements, um, you know, using the, 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 the IDE and the, and the GUI to create our select statements. And now in this example, we use select statements to um, encode that we wrote ourselves. So let's bring that up. One thing I've said in, in, about teaching is I really admire the TV chefs that are able to talk and do something else at the same time, like they'll be chopping celery or something as they're talking. Because, like, I was trying to, like, remember what is the URL for Canvas. And it was hard to talk and to think about that and to type it in all at the same time. So, and this doesn't even involve a knife. So if I mess up, the worst thing happens is I, I get like a, a, a Air 404 or whatever. So, um, I guess I admire TV chefs. You can tell I watch a lot of the Food Network, all right? Because the other, my other thing that I, the other tip I've taken from TV chefs is to have, if I'm developing a program, have a finished version of that program out somewhere. Just like they have like, <laughs> I'm going to pop this turkey in the oven. They come back from commercial like, here we go, the turkey's done, you know. It's like, hey, <clears throat> pretty good. All right, so let me pull down the example from last time and take a look. I would expect within the next couple of days to have your design graded. 
So I've graded up through Lab 7, and I have to say the resubmits on Lab 7, really good. Much better than the originals were. So. <laughs> Actually worked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, if you want to put it that way, um, oh, here we go. Um, the one thing I will say is that you have. The, the last page that you went to was supposed to have a list of the sections, and most people did that, but most people kind of took me like very literally and only had a list of the sections. Well, that would be confusing if you forgot like what class you clicked on. You know, like, you know, let's say you got distracted in the middle with a phone call and you're looking at a list of sections and it's like, Ooh, is this for CISS 216 or is this for CISS 243? That's why it would be good in that case to display on the top of the page. And I, I think you did that. I would say I remember a couple people did that, and it was like, yes, all right, good job on that. But um, to display the and again for your project, that's what I mean by header detail. Header detail is nothing more than showing a one-to-many relationship on a single page. So in the example of classes and sections, if you show information about the class on the top of the page, then you show a listing of all the sections, that's what I mean by header detail. There's a one-to-many relationship. Or if you showed a class and all the students that were in it, or a section rather, and all the students that were in it, that would be another example of a um, header detail. So I don't think I took off because I was in a good mood. No, I'm just kidding. That's not why I didn't take off. But I didn't take off because um, most people already reworked it, and the reworks were, were good and were a lot better, and I was, I was very, very happy with those. All right. I was in a Verizon store yesterday. Has anyone seen the, I forget who makes it, maybe Samsung, the edge with the curved screen? Ooh, that was pretty. I don't know, like, I, you know, I don't know anything about it. Like, it could be, could be a, a rubbish phone, but it looked really pretty. And this guy was driving a little drone around, controlled by an Android, and, like, going up to people and scaring them and making the drone jump and say things and all that. He was having a really good time. Verizon was getting their money's worth from that employee, let me tell you. <laughs> Although I told him, I said, you know what, if I go into a, you know, semi-tech store like the Verizon store, I mean, that's kind of tech, um, and there weren't guys playing with the new things that they got, I'd be really disappointed. I mean, that, that's what you got to do when you work at one of those places, all right? All right. So here we have the code from last time, and as you look at the code, you'll see all of the things that we would see if we were doing it via the GUI, all right? It's just that we did it through code as opposed to through the GUI. And again, sometimes that works better, you know? I'm not saying always do it this way or always do it that way, but if you know both techniques, then you can look at a situation and do what's right for that situation. Now, in this particular case, I'm not displaying anything on the screen as a result of the SQL statement. I'm simply looking to see if the person has, has put in the right login credentials. So in this case, it really wouldn't make sense to do the, the grid view and the, the data source the way that we did it in the previous examples. It makes more sense just to write the code in there. Another thing I could think of is if you had a choice between two search criteria. Let's say, for example, you were doing a library search, and you had a, a, a blank, a, a text box for the author and a text box for the title. 
and you wanted to make your search such that if you put in the title, it would search based on title. If you put in the author, it would search based on author. If you put in both, it would search based on both, right? That would be pretty intuitive and a pretty good way to do that. Well, if you think of how we've done our SQL statements before, and when we build them using the IDE, there's no ability to say like, well, sometimes my where clause is going to have the title in it, and sometimes it's going to have the author, and sometimes it's going to have both, right? There's no way to put that into the SQL statement that we create through the IDE. But programmatically, we certainly could go and do that. All right, we certainly could go and retrieve and have an if statement that would say if the, the text box for author is blank, then leave it off the where clause. And we could programmatically come up with this select command. All right, so again, know the framework, know the limitations of the framework, and then know how to go and do it custom. That's sort of the bigger point of the last couple of classes. One thing I try to do in all my classes, too, by the way, is, you know, we have to teach the specific tools, right? We, you know, this is an ASP.NET class. It would be horrible if you left this class and not know anything about creating ASP.NET pages, right? But at the same time, we want to have a broader vision as well, all right? What I said about frameworks and the frameworks work well for some sorts of problems and not so well for other sorts of problems is just true in general for frameworks. It's true, period. So therefore, this skill of like knowing how the framework works but knowing how to do it on your own is a good skill to have regardless of what environment you're coding in. All right, so here we have our login page and on the button click, we create programmatically all the objects that we would have created um, using the IDE. So we start and create a SQL data source. All right. SQL data source is, you know, contains essentially two pieces. It contains the connection information, that is what database we're connecting to, and it also contains the actual SQL statement or statements that we're going to execute. So these two lines set the connection information. And I'm pulling from the web config file the connection string that I have called connection string. All right. And to connect to the database, you need two things. You need the provider and the connection string. So you, I pull those two fields out of the web config file. I create my SQL statement. And we said last time that to determine if someone is logged in correctly, you would want to look and make sure that their user ID, you look for a row that the user ID and password matches what was entered in. So in other words, select player ID from player where user ID equals question mark and user password equals question mark. All right. Now, we did that through the IDE, right? We either typed it in or we used their tool to build our SQL statement. But again, nothing new really here. We're following the same steps that we did when we used the IDE, except we're coding it on our own. All right? What do we typically do next then? We say where the parameters get their values from, right? The question mark, again, is a placeholder. That's going to be plugged in at runtime with some value, all right? Namely, the value from the different text boxes. So I associate the first parameter with the text box for user ID, and I set the second parameter with the, the value of the text box password. The next piece really doesn't have an analogy in the framework. It's something that we have to code custom because we're not binding the data to a uh, a visual control, but we need some place to put the data that we're going to retrieve. And it's not a visual control, it's a data reader. So we set the mode of our data source for data reader, and we create a data reader that says go ahead and run our SQL statement. 
The result then is placed in my data. And it's placed in essentially a two by two array, or, or, or yeah, uh, uh, a two dimensional array. All right? You could think of this as a table, right? The results of a SQL statement is a table of data. In other words, there are rows and there are columns. How many rows are there? Well, it depends on how many, how many rows the SQL statement selected. In our case, we know, because we're looking at a user ID and password combination, and the user ID is unique, we know at most there's going to be one row, right? If it matches the user ID and password, there'll be one row. If, however, it doesn't match anything, there'll be zero rows. So our case is simple. We don't really have to loop through anything. We simply say, hey, give me the first row in the data source. And if there's nothing there, the person didn't supply the right credentials. All right. What read does for this data reader class is it gives me the next row in the list. All right. So if I do read, 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 I've gotten the first row, the second row, the third row of the list. Each read grabs the next row in the list. Again, by definition here, we only look at one row because we know that this is either going to return one row or it's going to return zero rows. So if it got something, then it's a valid login, right? Because one row matched that user ID and password that was entered. So we do a read of our data source. This either returns a true or false. It returns a true if there's something there for that row. All right? It returns a false if there's nothing there. So the first time I read it, if it returns a true, it means that there's one row in the data source, at least one row. If I were to do a second read in this case, it would always be false, right? Because each read looks at the next row, We've already determined that even in the case of a legal login, there's at most one row in there. So if we try to do two reads, we're going to get a false for that. I mentioned it's sort of like a, a, a two-dimensional array. There are rows. There's also columns. And the columns, again, start numbering with zero. What do the columns correspond to? The columns correspond to the number of the position in the SQL statement. So for example here, player ID is my data sub zero. Since that's the only column that we have in our select statement, that's the only legal subscript that we have. When they've successfully logged on, we store in a session variable that value. That's what this line does. It says, store in a session value, a variable, that value. And when, do, uh, when does that go away? That goes away when the session ends. So um, if I let the browser sit for a certain period of time and went to lunch and came back, it would forget who I was. The session would expire. If I had a log off button and clicked the button to log off and executed the proper code, it would forget who I am, and so on. Or if I closed the browser and started a different browser session, that would be a different browser session, and it would not remember who I was. All right. After we set the session variable, we redirect to the player info, and the player info shows the information about that player. The idea here was in this application, we were going to let someone log in, and if they logged in successfully, they could see their player information. Eventually, we're going to allow them to edit their player information too, but at first, we're just going to look at it. They did log in successfully. We simply display that the login was unsuccessful. We talked last time about case sensitive, and we talked last time about whether we want to differentiate between whether the, the user ID was wrong or the password, all those things that we could, we could extend if we wanted to. Now, there is
there's a login mechanism in ASP.NET, all right, built in. I find it kind of messy. I don't know. And again, it's always good to know how to do something yourself so that you're not, um, you're not at the mercy of the framework and the IDE. You can write simple custom code if you need it. Now, when I redirect to the player info page, that simply tells them, tells the server, hey, we're working on this page, but if they success successfully logged on, go to this page. What that page does then is this page is like all the pages that we've done so far in that it has a SQL data source and it has a details view. And the SQL data source is built just like we did it before. Points to the right connection string and so on. Our SQL statement says select star from player where player ID equals question mark. Now the big difference here is that question mark is not going to be filled in from the query string like we did in some examples or a form control like we did in other examples, but rather is filled in from the session ID. All right. So to run this, and again, I realize this is review of last time, but Again, I, I do understand that, you know, sometimes it takes a little while to absorb some of these things. Notice a couple things. First of all, if I go to that player info page and I'm not logged on, it displays a blank page. That's probably not good. All right. If I go to the default page, it puts me in puts me to that page and it and it displays my information. All right, which is what we would want it to do. All right. And I could have other links and link around, and if I came back to this page, it would still remember, provided that my session hadn't expired. All right? Now, what would you want to have happen if I tried to go to the player page and I hadn't logged on yet? How would you want that to work? So I'm going to set the player information page as a start page, and if I go and execute that, clearly this is not the right answer to give them a blank page, all right? We can pretty well agree on that, all right? What should it do? <clears throat> link to the login page. Should read, yeah. You could have a link to say, click here to go to the login page, or we could just have it redirect to the login page. I'm not sure which one of those two you meant. Uh, we might as well just redirect them there, all right? And we could do this to any of the pages that we had where you had to be logged in, all right? So, for example, in Canvas, there's some pages you don't have to be logged in to access, right? I think. The home page, and I think there's like help pages and stuff like that. There are other pages that you do have to be logged in to see. Well, let's think for a second. All right, let's put our thinking caps on. If we have some pages that act one way, and other pages that act a different way, what would be maybe a way to handle that? They all come from the same database. Pardon me? Yeah, they will all come from the same database. Oh, they would. Yeah, they would. Two different master pages. Have two different master pages. Mm -hmm. And one of them have code to like make sure you're logged in, and if you're not logged in, redirect to the login page. And the other one where you're not required to log in, well, it, it doesn't check to see if you're logged in or not. It doesn't care. All right? So that would be another use of creating master pages. When we talked about master pages originally, we talked about them from the perspective of uh, the visual, um, getting a visual consistency. You could also do that for code, for where you want to have common code between pages. And that would be a great example of, I could, and again, I could nest my master pages, right? I could have my master page 
I could then have a second master page for restricted pages, all right, inherit from the first master page to get the visual aspect of it, and then insert the code that makes sure the user's logged in. If they're not logged in, redirect them to the login page. Oh, that's, that's, that's sweet, all right. I almost want to do that, all right. Uh, we'll, we'll see how time goes. We'll, let, let's finish this train of thoughts and, and then possibly we'll do this either, either end of class today or um, next week. At the very least, though, this is not the right answer. All right? So, what am I going to do? <coughs> I'm going to go in my player info code, and what should I do? All right, if player ID equals zero, right idea, the specifics are a little off, yeah, is null. If there's nothing in the session ID for player, then I know that they're not logged in. What do I want to do then? Redirect them to the login page. Where am I going to put this code? In, in C Sharp. All right, in the player info page, but on what method? Well, remember, this is the code that we want to have executed if they have not logged in, so they have not pressed the login button. This is the page that this is the page that we want to do it for. There's no buttons on this page. If they try to access this page and they're not logged in. It happens to be, if we right mouse, view code, there are certain methods that automatically fire off when a page is loaded. All right? And the code that, load, that, that runs when the page first loads is cleverly enough called the page load event. All right? Now, This one's going to be a straightforward one, all right? Because, yeah, when the page loads, we're going to check this. If it's not on the right page, if they're, if they're not logged on, rather, we're going, to, we're going to redirect them to the right page. There are other times when it's confusing where to put the code. So, one thing to become familiar with, especially if it's causing you problems, right? If it's not causing you problems, then you can probably ignore this and worry about um, when Fallout 4 is coming out or whatever. Right? <laughs> I don't even know what that means. I, I know it's a video game, <laughs> right? I know, I know that much, but I'm not, I'm not sure like what kind of video game it is or... The best. The, the best kind, okay. And, and like, it, it is funny because like, I'm definitely behind the times video game wise, all right? Um, and, and it's just amazing, like, when, did, when was it decided by everyone in the world that this is the best game? I mean, the last one I remember, I mean, I remember people talk about Call of Duty and, and, and uh, uh, Grand Theft Auto and Tetris and Pong and all those as being, like, the best games. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I like, like, when does when everyone decide that, yeah, this one's the best game? But anyhow. Uh, I'm going to look at ASP.NET page lifecycle, page lifecycle events. And this will give you some documentation that talks about the events that fire off. All right? And the kind of code that you can put in there. There's a pre-init, there's an init, there's an init complete, there's a preload, there's a load. There are events associated with each of the controls, all right? This one is one that burns me from time to time, all right? Is if I'm having a bad day or something, I will put code in the page load event that looks to try to see if something happened in the control or vice versa. And the page 
uh, load event happens before the individual events on the control. So for example, text changed is a, if a text box changes, the text changed event fires off. Um, or if I click a button, that fires off after the page load. All right. And if you're not careful, you can get erroneous results because you assume something has happened when it hasn't. All right. So you got to be careful when you do that. And then so on down the line throughout all of those. Again, the, one I, the ones I typically have trouble with is, uh, you know, remembering the control events happen after the load, but before the load complete. So if you wanted some code that executed after all the page control events happen, all the, the controls on the page, you'd put it in the load complete as opposed to the load. We're going to see more of, more of these events um, in upcoming weeks when we start dealing with updating stuff. All right, when we start dealing like updating. There's actually code that goes, that fires off before you uh, do an update. And there's code that fires off after you do an update. All right? And we'll see how we can use that to do things like, you know, exception catching and, and so on. All right? So know your events is the bottom line. But it is confusing. That's why if everything's working, you might be able to ignore this a little bit. So I'm going to say if. And how do I refer to a session variable? Well, it's simply session, the square brackets, and then the name of the session variable, which is what? What did I call it? Player ID. C-sharp equivalent of the is null function. Yeah, equals. Equals null? Okay. You know, I don't mind at all admitting I don't know stuff. For a couple reasons. It's being honest. gives me too much grief about it, I control your grade, so <laughs> not worried about it from that perspective. And I think it's, it's good to see that, you know, when you're learning programming, there are more important things to learn than the um, specific syntactical details, because you can always look those up, all right? If you don't get the concept of a session variable, it doesn't matter if you can test if a variable is null or not. You're not going to get that right. But if I know the concept of a session variable, then yeah, I can Google how do I test in C sharp if something's null, if that makes sense. All right, so response. Response. 
redirect default I can't type for anything today in all server-side scripting environments two, um, two objects, a response and a request, all right? In PHP, there's response and request in, in every language. Why is that? Because that's a model of what goes on in the interaction between client and server. And if you're not sure where something belongs, Remember, the response is the server responding to the client, and the request is the client asking the user something. So if you're looking for a variable, all right, like in, okay, you guys, I'm assuming that you guys, I'm assuming that many of you don't know PHP, all right, because I don't recall any of you being in my PHP class, so unless you picked it up on your own. with maybe an exception. Now, where's the query string value is going to be in PHP? In the request or the response? Well, do the, does the query string come from the client to the server? Or does the query string go from the server to the client? It goes from the client to the server. So it is part of the request object. All right. So. You don't even have to memorize those things. Just remember that request and response are used in most scripting languages, and request deals with the client sending something to the server. Response deals with the server sending a response to that. In this case, redirect. Well, the server is telling the client, no, you're not allowed on this page. Go to the login page. So it's a response. And the server's response is, no, you can't go to this page. Go to this page instead. So let's run this and make sure that it works. I'm going to make sure this guy is set as a start page. And run this. And voila, I'm at the login page. Yes? So this is just me probably thinking ahead, but when you have like a, like a bigger website, you could have multiple pages, and you go to a page where like you're trying to do stuff, and it obviously you need to be logged in. Mm -hmm. So then it kicks you back to the login page. But if you log in here, like we only have one page, it's going to take us to the next page. Uh -huh. But it wouldn't go back to the page where you were on before. Right. You know what I'm saying? Okay. That's a good question. Because I hate when it just takes you to a generic page and you have to navigate back there. Yes. In other words, let's say... Let's pretend we're on Amazon, and I don't know if this is how Amazon is actually configured, but we'll pretend. Let's say there's a view card, and then on a product page, there's an add to cart. Now, both of those, we're going to assume, require you to be logged on. No shopping carts for unregistered people, right? The question asked is that if I click this and I click that, the pages, the view card and add to card, could have similar logic to what I just wrote to say if they're logged in, fine. If they're not logged in, then boom, send them to the login page. So if they're not logged in, they get redirected to the login page. Now, his question is, is after logging in, after logging in, how can I redirect this user to this page or this user to that page? How could I do that? Let's think about it for a minute, because believe it or not, I think you have all the tools to answer this question. Okay. All right. 
an if statement. Right now, we just have a redirect. All right? We could do something that says, if you came from here, go there. If you came from there, go there. Mm -hmm. How are we going to know where they came from? All right. Good, good answer. There is any number of ways we could remember how, what page they used to be on. Right? This is another question that relates to how do I maintain state on a website? How does this page know that I came from here or I came from here? And what are the ways that we can maintain state? Well, we've talked about a few. It could, be, could come from a control. Uh, it doesn't really make sense here. Usually control is within one page calling back itself. We could put it in a session variable. All right, that would be a possibility. When I click this button, I could remember what page I'm on, store that in a session variable, and use that to redirect. All right, or I could pass on the query string. In other words, this page could redirect to, this page could go to login.aspx, question mark, from, cart.aspx, viewcart.aspx. This one could go to login.aspx, question mark, from equals, add cart.aspx. So then this page then knows where it came from. It can pull it from the query string, and it can then, instead of always redirecting to the same page, it can look to see what was in the query string and redirect that way. So again, any time that you want to know, like, like, where did it come from? Has the user done this? Has the user logged on? All those things are questions of state and maintaining state. And we're back again to the different methods of maintaining state cookies, which we have not talked about, session variables, form controls, URL with the query string. So that's an excellent question. Excellent question. There's so many things I'd like to do. I'd like to go and do that right now, but I want to get to some other things first. Maybe, maybe I don't know. We'll, 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 I'll see how it fits into the schedule. All right. Now, I have to say, I am guilty, at this point, I am guilty of the mistake that a lot of programmers make. All right? What do you think I'm guilty of? I know, you know, not dressing nicely and, and showing up late and all those things. Those are all things that a lot of programmers do. But what am I guilty about with regards to this? Is my testing job done? No. I tested to make sure that the one, the new functionality I added worked. All right? In other words, that if you're not logged on and you try to go to the player page, it yells at you and sends you back to the login page. I have not tested if I log in successfully, does it take me to the player page? I've only tested half of the job. I've assumed that I didn't break that part. Oh, worst thing you could possibly do, or one of the worst <laughs> things you could possibly do, is assume that, you know, if, 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 I had a, if I had a dollar for every time a programmer told me that all I did was change this one line, so of course such and such is still going to work, I would have an awful lot of dollars, all right? Because there's things that you just don't think about or, or whatever. The bottom line is, is it just takes a minute to test it and prove that it's right. All right? This is sometimes known as regression testing. All right? Regression testing is where you make sure you haven't broke something that used to work. All right? We added some new functionality here, and we tested that, make sure that that worked. Well, did we screw up anything else? So let's go in and test it. One thing that I always swear that I'm going to do, but depending on time, 
um, I, I don't always do it, is um, when you create a program of any kind to develop a test plan. And a test plan is a systematic way of testing to make sure your code works. What do I mean by systematic? I mean that it looks at and considers every possibility. So a test plan for this particular change would be, if I log in, do I get directed to the player page? If I try to get to the player page without logging in, does it redirect me? It would be both of those things. So let's see, does this still work? And it does. Okay. Good. All right. So now I know that this functionality works because I've tested both cases. Now, when you start getting in larger and larger applications and larger problems, the cases sort of multiply exponentially, you know. Like, for example, in, in, in this example, Maybe you go somewhere else if you're a coach versus a player. All right? Maybe if you're a player, you go to this page. Maybe if you're a coach, you go to the, your roster page. Well, then all of a sudden, your testing has probably more than doubled, right? Because I'd have to make sure logging in as a player works. Logging in as a coach works. Trying to access the coach when you're not logged in takes you to log in. Trying to access the player when you're not logged in takes you to the login. Trying to access the coach when you are logged in, but you're logged in as a player. Trying to access a player when you're logged in, but you're logged in as a coach. So again, it doesn't take long for all the possible situations to um, to, to you know to, to to really increase. Now. You know, can you test for every conceivable possibility? No, but you ought to be as systematic as possible in developing your test plan and doing your test. All right. I'm going to do some more with session variables just to sort of, um, just sort of more fun with session variables. All right. Um, I want to create another page, and I just want it to have a personalized greeting. Hello, Mike. And then here is your news, or something like that. All right. So, how would I accomplish that? I'm going to have a news page now. Now, the news page, I want to be able to access whether I'm logged in or not. All right. If I am not logged in, it doesn't say anything. If I am logged in, it says hello, Mike, or hello, whatever the person's first name is. How am I going to go and do that? So you want to have access whether you're logged in or not, mm -hmm. but it's going to greet you only if you're logged in. Exactly. So you have a statement that checks if there is a session variable for that person. Okay. So I'm going to have an if statement. It's going to be similar to this. on the database level. Okay. That wouldn't be anything we would do in our code. Okay. Okay. So we'd have an if statement similar to this. All right. Except we're not going to redirect. We're going to set a we're going to set a label if they're logged in. Where am I going to get their name from? Database. The database. All right. That's, that's a true statement. When am I going to grab their, their name? After you verify the login. I would grab it after I verified the login. All right? I could 
online news page, do a database query and pull their first name. But if you think about doing this on every single page, to hit the database on every page that you go to simply to display the name, well, when they log in, grab their name and just remember it for the whole time that they're logged in. Now, what if someone changes their name uh, there? Well, you would have some code in the edit program that would change the session variable if they change their first name. All right, but that's a small, small risk. So let's go and create our news page. I mean about like being comfortable switching between code. I accidentally dropped that label inside the H1. Is there a way I could the, through the GUI go and put it back? Yeah, it probably is. Do I want to sit there spending the next two hours of my life trying to figure out how? No, I don't. Not when I can go here and I know what's going on and I can cut and paste it in the right spot. So, I can initialize the text to nothing. Alright. Then I can have in the code behind, label one dot text. equals hello first name Now, I better change, flip the comparison and say if it's not now, not null. All right, now, when they log in, I'm going to have to remember their first name, because right now I'm only remembering in a session variable their ID. So, what do I need to change here? This is always a good exercise as you're learning something, to be able to take something and alter it. What do I need to change here so that I can remember their, na their name in addition to their player ID? Okay, and the SQL statement. I need to include their first name. All right. So now I'm pulling their first name. What else do I need to change? The session. Where I'm stuffing the session variable, I can say. What's the 
it's going to say. I did a one. Because again, remember that I did one read, so I'm looking at the first row. I want the second column from the first row, and the column gets labeled zero and one. All right. So. Yeah, or, or at least include a, a news link somewhere. This is where it would be nice if I would have done this with a master page. All right. Uh, as it turns out, I'm just going to type in the URL. I'm going to do the thing that aggravates me when students do it, uh, and I have to remember the name of all their pages. So I'll go here. I come to the login page. I'm sorry, I come to the player info page. Get redirected to the login page. If I go to news.aspx, I get with no greeting, all right, because I'm not logged in yet. If, however, I log on, it remembers who I am. All right. Now, we mentioned all the different ways that a, um, um, a session could be terminated. It could time out. Well, that's one way. <laughs> What's the other way? You could explicitly log out. How do you log out? Um, there is a uh, session expire method. All right. And you simply say session.expire, call that method, and that would log you out. So I'm not going to go to the trouble of creating a logout page, but that's how you do it. That effectively is saying, release those resources. You no longer need to remember everything that you've remembered about me. which is a good idea to get your users to do. Again, it's a win-win situation. It protects their privacy, so if they were to leave their, their, their workstation, um, someone couldn't come up and, and do things as them. But it also relieves the, see, the server uh, the burden of having to remember all this stuff for a particular user. You can actually put anything in a session variable. You can put objects in a session variable. But that typically uh, is a resource issue when you do that. So generally speaking, it's better if you're storing primitives. And usually the kind of things that you think about storing for a user is going to be a primitive anyhow. All right. Yes? Well, the session.expire logs you off that instant. When that line of code is executed, that would be like if you had a logout button or a logout link and you went to a page. Okay, I thought that's for, we don't do that after. I thought it does it by itself. It does. All right. No, without us logging out. When you just are not active a certain amount of time. It does, but. It does that too. There, there's two ways that you can expire a session. It can time out or you can, all right, you can set in web config how to do timeouts. You can put it in your code in C sharp. That would be the timeout. But if you wanted to log off this instant, you would say session.expire. So you can set the session timeout programmatically, or you can say log out right now. Boom, they're logged out. Um, allowing you to set the session timeout individually allows you to create a default for the whole application and then override it for a given 
um, piece of functionality. So like, for example, in Canvas, um, they could set maybe a 15, 20 minute session timeout, but if you go into a quiz or an exam, they could give you a longer period. All right, and that way it would keep, keep it from logging you off midway through. All right, next thing I want to talk about is let's talk about changing this page so that the person can edit their personal information, right? You can log on, right, and see your uh, information, but you might want to be able to edit it as well, all right? So let's go and let's see how we are going to do that, all right? First thing we need to do, and, re and remember I said that at the beginning of, of this section, when we started talking about database and their activity, I said we'll do a little bit of database, a little bit of ASP.NET. Now we're back to doing a little bit of database. What is the command to update a row in a database? Or to update rows in a database? Update. Very good. It's the update command. All right. What does that command look like? And I'm going to use our table, our player table, just uh, because we might as well, right? Because that's what we're going to do this example on. So my player is named table. My table is called player. Did I just say my table is named table? My table is named player. ID, F name, L name, email. Um, user ID and password. talk about inserts and deletes um, next week. So the command to do an update is update. You then have the name of the table, which is player. Okay. Can you update more than one table in a single SQL statement? Not really. Um, there could be cascading things that we talked about before, but your update statement is only for one table. We then have the word set. Then we have column name, new value. So I could say F name equals Michael. L name equals Zellers, and there's commas between each of those. Email equals statement. Update, name of the table, set, then a list of column names equals values, then a comma. No comma after the last one, a semicolon. Now this is assuming uh, that all of these values are strings. If there are numbers, 
ones, you would not have the quotes. If there were dates, you would have uh, a different formatting for those. Okay. What could go wrong with an up? Well, okay, let, well, let, let's back up. First of all, what's wrong with this update statement? There's a huge problem with this update statement. Yes? You're not telling us which player to update. Not saying which player to update, right. So what would running this, this statement do? It would turn everyone into Mike Zellers, all right? Which we know is a nightmare situation, so we would want to avoid that at all costs. Now, I'm going to make a statement here. Typically, how do you select what you're doing an operation on? You do it with a WHERE clause. Maybe, or maybe you don't want to do it with a WHERE clause. I'm going to do it with a WHERE clause. How do I guarantee that I change the one person that I want to in here? Using the primary key, the player ID. What if there is no play person with a player ID of one? Does that give an error? <laughs> Actually, no, it doesn't. It thinks it did its job. It says, yep, I went and updated everyone whose player ID is one. All right. Well, of course, there, there ain't no one who has a player ID of one, so I didn't update anyone. Right? But that, strictly speaking, is not an error. If I say update and this does not match anyone. So it's not an error. It just won't update anyone. All right. And, you know, that's, that probably won't be an issue the way that we're going to write our update statements because we're going to know the primary key is a valid primary key. So our updates are going to work unless there's a problem. All right? And if there is a problem then, though, it is important to know that an update that doesn't update anything, strictly speaking, isn't an error. Yes? So update command works only one table. One table. You need more than one update command then. No, I mean, can we update more than one player? Yes, you could. Okay. Um, but I'll tell you, within the realm of web applications, you're not frequently going to do that. All right? But you could in other contexts. Let me give you an example of when you might want to update more than one row. All right? Let's say I'm a company that has sales reps. All right? And... I have sale, you know, my company's across the whole nation. So I have a sales rep who's responsible for the Ohio customers. All right? Bill. Bill handles Ohio. All right? So in every customer table, in, in every customer that has a state of Ohio, Bill is listed as their sales manager. Okay? Now, Bill quits, and Mary takes over for Bill. All right. I could write an update statement that says, update sales rep, update customer, set sales rep equal to Mary, where sales rep equals Bill. And what it would do is it would find everyone who matched Bill and change the value of their sales rep to Mary. So that's reasonable. I could do something like that if I was transferring or if I transferred, uh, you know, um, employees from one division into another or whatever. But typically, in most web applications, you're not really doing that. In most web applications, you're pulling up and looking at a row and saying, I want to change this specific row. So to answer your question, yes, you could. But that's usually not what you're doing in web applications. All right? But an excellent question. All right? 
So we're typically going to be using the primary key to make sure we update the right one. All right? So now we have that fixed. What could go wrong with this update statement? I'm going to assume that I have all the columns spelled right and all that. No, no problem like that. But what could go wrong with this update statement? Or a similar update statement. One thing we said it could go wrong is if we didn't have someone with that user ID. And that's not really an error, but it's probably not what we intended to do. Yes? Let's say if that's not what you want to change it to, because it's not really an error. Yeah, that's like yeah, like in other words, if if I wanted to change I didn't want to change it to Michael, I wanted to change it to Mark or something. Yeah, that's not that's not really, that's outside of the, the SQL statement did its job right. What could cause this update statement to fail? That's a better question. What could cause this update statement to fail? Let me rephrase that. What could cause any update statement to fail? Not just this one. Well, yeah, the, assuming we got, we have the, the syntax of the statement right. No data? Or no data in a required data. field. Or invalid data? Or invalid data. In other words, well, let's, let's cover these one at a time. No data. If first name was required field and I tried to set it to null, boom, it's going to blow up. All right? If there was a team ID associated with the player, and I gave a team ID that didn't exist in my database, boom, it's going to blow up. It provided there was a foreign key set for that. All right? What if I made this? Or user ID equals, or user ID equals PN. Well, we already got Paul Norod in the database who has a user ID of PN. So, and user ID is set to be required to be unique. It's a unique index. So therefore, that would blow up. In a nutshell, again, forgetting about the the, the obvious blame there, is where you get a column name spelled wrong or whatever. You run into problems with an update if you violate any of the constraints of the database. All right? And what are some of the constraints of the database? Fields are required. Fields are foreign keys into other tables. Fields contain unique indexes. Possibly duplicate primary keys. Any of those constraints will cause an update statement to blow up. Remember. We want to create constraints in our database because that protects us from having an update statement that could update this person and assign them to a team that doesn't exist. All right? So we want those constraints in there, and we want to make sure that, the, uh, that, that everyone has a name and that everyone's user ID is unique and all that. Therefore, we build those conditions in the database. All right? And if something goes wrong, then that update will fail. Now, how can we, how, obviously if something can fail, we want to, as programmers, we want to do something about it. All right. I'm going to go a little bit long today, maybe another three to, to, to 45 minutes. No, probably just a couple minutes. All right. What are ways that we can handle potential errors in an update statement? We can do validation. That's one way. If the first name is required, then you put a required field validator on it. And then they can't get past it with a, with a um, uh, no first name. What's another way we could do it? How could we handle, for example, team ID, that it has to be one of the valid teams in the database? Drop Have a drop down instead of a free form text. In a free form text, they could type anything in for the team ID. 
all right? Whereas a drop-down, they would only be able to select that, all right? So, we can eliminate a lot of errors simply by our form design and design of the interface, all right? We could possibly write C-sharp code to look for some errors if we could not easily accomplish that. So, for example, checking to make sure that there's not a duplicate user ID. We could write C-sharp code to do that, maybe, all right? Or our last option is let it blow up, all right? But be there to pick up the pieces and display an error message and let the user know what they need to do to correct it, all right? So next time we'll see strategies that we can take with all of these to prevent errors if we can, or at the very least, handle errors so that they're not a problem. Handle errors gracefully. So we'll see examples of all of those with that update. Yes? No. And just, okay. No. Updates are all or nothing. Okay. So it would update, it, the update would work completely or the update would fail completely. In reality, that first one where I forgot the where clause, that wouldn't have updated anyone because it would have violated, it would try to make everyone have a user ID of MLZ and that would not be permissible. So I kind of lied. It wouldn't make everyone into Mike Zellers. But if I left off that part, it would have gone and changed everyone's name to that. But yeah, SQL statements are like that. They don't partially succeed. They either succeed or they fail. All right, and updates, inserts, deletes, everything's like that. All right, next time we'll continue with that and we'll build um, the ability to update and, and catch for errors um, into the database that we're looking at today.